Hey everyone, welcome back. It's Investorzilla with another stock deep dive. We are going to be talking about Chewy.com, ticker symbol CHWY. Now they recently reported Q4 earnings for 2020, which triggered me to look at this stock. Now this stock is something, that, this stock is one that I'm super interested in. And I've been researching it for probably two, three weeks now. Um, I'll get into the good, the great, the bad, and the ugly things about this stock and let you know what I'm doing, buying, waiting, or staying away forever. Now, before we get going, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and comment below. It only takes a moment and will help me immensely to build this channel to where I want it to be. Now on to Chewy.com. So, let's get into the uh, boring corporate overview <laughs> Uh, I won't read this whole thing, but a few things I'll call out. Our mission is to be the most trusted and convenient online destination for pet parents and partners everywhere. We view pets and pet parents as family and are obsessed with meeting their needs and exceeding customer expectations through every interaction. Launched in 2011, we offer the personalized service of Neighborhood Pet Store alongside the convenience and speed of e-commerce. Chewy.com sells everything pet-related, food, toys, treats, cages, you name it, they probably have it. Looking at their website, it's really well done. Very easy to navigate and has a ton of product varieties. And to be super transparent, we do buy our pet food from Chewy.com, specifically using the auto ship feature. Now this site, Looks very familiar to almost every other e-commerce site. So like nothing groundbreaking that I saw, but it is still a really well done site. Now here's a list of categories they offer. Everything from dog, cat, horse, and reptile, which is pretty, pretty cool. I think it's incredible the range of products they have. And I personally always found what I'm looking for, but typically I'm only buying for like guinea pigs, cats, dogs, stuff like that. But it would be interesting to hear from people that are buying things like in the pet farm supplies or, or I mean, the yeah, the farm supplies or the not so common uh, items just to see if they have the same experience. Now, this is an item that we've actually bought a lot of on both Chewy and Amazon. Um, on the top here is the item on Chewy.com. On the bottom, it's the item on Amazon.com. You can see really quickly that the prices do line up pretty good and even for the subscribe and save, same, same matching 66.49. Now, one of them is the large reach puppy. The other is, and I didn't notice that when I took the screenshot, but when I switched it over, it was exactly the same price, whether it was large reach puppy or not. In fact, I would say that for most cases, most items that I've found, they either match Amazon or Chewy actually beats Amazon for prices for the things that we look for. Now, I have a cat that has kidney issues. So we have to get this prescription cat food, which is actually really expensive. The price is just the same again on Amazon and Chewy. We buy it from Chewy. We use the auto ship feature. The process we had to go through to send prescriptions in from our vet, very painless. Got processed pretty quickly. We were able to order right away. Now, Chewy actually has, in this case, a manufacturer's coupon that you can apply and actually get a little bit cheaper. Again, we sign up for the auto ship for most of our pet supplies. So it saves us a few bucks. In this case, we can call it another tie, even though right now you can save a few dollars with the, the coupon. Going into the leadership team, we're going to dig into Summit Singh the CEO and director of Chewy, and Satish Mehta, Mehta, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, the chief technology officer of Chewy. As always, I'd recommend looking at the rest of the executive team as well as the board of directors, but hopefully diving into these two gentlemen will give you a perspective on the leadership that Chewy has. On the investor relation page, it says Mr. Singh serves as our CEO since 2018. From 2017 to 2018, he served as our CEO, Chief Operating Officer. From 2015 to 2017, he served as the Worldwide Director of Amazon.com's Consumable Businesses, which are 
Trash and Pantry. And from 2013 to 2015, as director and GM of Amer Amazon Inc. North American Merchant Fulfillment and third-party businesses. That's a mouthful. Prior to Amazon, he served in management positions at Dell. He's had some great e-commerce experience from what I can tell here. No experience directly in the pet industry, though. Although his experiences at Amazon are key, as well as the fact that he's been with Chewy since 2017. So he, he knows the business. Now, looking at his LinkedIn, everything lines up with what it says on the investor relations page. It looks like his career really started in 2003 with about 10 years at Dell. I am fascinated by his one entry called miscellaneous and varied learning experiences. Maybe internships or things like that during that time frame. Now, on to Satish. He is the CTO of Chewy.com. Joined the company in 2018 of June, June 2018. In this role, Satish is responsible for overseeing all infrastructure technologies across the company. Before going in, I am expecting him to be very technical, so I'll be looking for that as we go forward. Because he is leading the technology teams that support Chewy's rapidly growing e-commerce platforms and developing innovative solutions that enhance the online experience for Chewy customers. He has held a range of positions, including VP of Data and Analytics at the United Healthcare Group, VP of Omnichannel Sales and Marketing Data at Staples, and various roles with data platforms and operations at Yahoo. Holds a degree in Physics and an, an MBA. I also find it interesting that here, it doesn't sound like he's had a very like tactical, technical background. I usually like to see T CTOs that you know work as like an engineer for a while or data scientist or, you know, somewhere a little bit lower. But so let's take a look at his LinkedIn. So back in 2000, he was a tech lead at um, Gap Inc. Uh, so they're it's a bit more of the tactical experience I would look for. Everything else is pretty much what we expected. He has a lot of experience leading data teams, which is super important to Chewy, in my opinion. To be honest, though, Chewy is probably the largest scale thing he's been a part of. Although I'd be curious to see if he manages the product team as well, um, because I don't really see a product exec on the list of executives. What I mean by that is there's usually a technical lead and a product lead. Product lead really focuses on, you know, what does a customer want? Technical lead really focuses on how do we deliver that product need? So I'm a bit confused who leads the product team at Chewy. I'd love to actually see an org chart to see where like the product managers and everything report up to. But for now, I'm going to assume it's Satish. Now, let's dig into the culture of this company. As you know, culture is so important to me. I don't really invest into companies that don't have a good culture. Um, and this is where it gets ugly. Only 52% of people would recommend this company to a friend. Think about the recruiting issues with that. 62% approve of the CEO. Now, this is out of 1,189 English reviews. This company seems to work their team hard, and this is going to end up costing them. I read through a bunch of the reviews here, and I would say this is not a great culture, at least not how it's portrayed on Glassdoor. For example, if I was looking for a position as an engineer, I'd probably steer clear of this culture, um, this company, just due to the culture. I'm hoping they can turn this around, although I'm not super optimistic about that. But let's just keep an eye on this and come back and visit it, and maybe let's filter down to like look at the last year of reviews. Keep in mind, though, that sometimes you have to dig a little bit deeper when you're looking for a specific job to see if the culture issues are in the department that you're going to. So just spend some time going through the positive and negative reviews. Get a feeling for the company yourself. You know, there are like a lot of probably lower paying jobs at this organization where they um, probably are more apt to, you know, give it a lower review. Okay, job opening. 757 listed on their website. Way too many for me to list here. I'm actually blown away that they have that many, which means their cost of 
operations are going to go through the roof if they can actually execute on hiring these positions. On this page, you can see a few of the openings in accounting, program management, brand, safety and loss, a few more roles to list, tons of software engineers, healthcare analytics, <clears throat> excuse me, and data engineering, also some product management openings. There are a lot of director positions and high level senior positions here. This company is growing a ton, but with poor Glassdoor ratings, it's probably going to be hard for them to fill these positions quickly. I worry about their ability to keep and grow employees too, because I saw a lot of churn and coworker churn mentioned in some of the reviews I was reading. Now, onto some of the good things about this company. They just released Q4 2020 earnings, pulling from their investor statement. I usually don't like their diagrams, but it's actually a pretty good one. 2.04 billion in sales, 50.8% year over year growth for revenue. That is mind blowing. 19.2 active customers, 19.2 million active customers, which is also a growth of 42.7%. Total sales for 2020 was 7.15 billion, 47.4% growth there. They grew margins 27.1% for Q4 in 2020 with a net margin of 1%. Q4 net income of 21.0 million, a growth of 82 million year over year, net loss of 92.5 million. These numbers look really good for a company at this scale. I don't think they're going to keep this growth. Like there's no way they can hit a 40% growth in 2021, for example. Maybe I'd be surprised. Now, the stock did spike quite a bit because of the, the beat on um, earnings here. I just want to point out, the company is still losing money, like a lot of money. But it's getting a lot closer to break even than where it was. This balance sheet is not good. Now, this is prior to the Jan 2020 earnings. You can see that they have a total capitalization of negative $403 million. What this means is that if you take all their assets, subtract their liabilities, the company is short $403 million. I don't like balance sheets like this at all. Now, I get they can raise money, but it still doesn't give me that warm, fuzzy feeling that I get. You know, if this company were to um, suffer a massive downturn, could they survive it? I don't think they will, but it still makes me a little bit nervous. Looking at what they reported for Q4, though, you can see that their current assets went up to $1.7 billion, while total, bill, total liabilities went up to $1.7 billion. So now it's almost a wash. So that means this would eventually be a total capitalization of close to $0. A lot better, but this company is not cash rich. Is this company going to be able to continue burning as much money as it is and still grow at the rate they need to and hire the people that we looked at? I'm usually a lot more comfortable if a company has a better balance sheet than this. Now, on a good note, net sales increasing almost 2.1 billion. That is incredible, especially considering that growth profit increased a decent amount as well. This shows the company is about to turn a corner and maybe become profitable in a few years but looking at yahoo finance analysts don't expect profitability even through 2023 that might change with the, the recently released numbers but honestly this company probably is years away from a positive eps what does guidance look like for q1 of 2021 they look to have 2.11 billion to 2.13 billion in revenue a growth of 30 to 31% year over year. That's pretty dang good. Net sales for the year between 8.85 billion and 8.95 billion, a 24 to 25% growth uh, year over year. Now, it does show you growth is slowing down a bit, but the, honestly, the numbers are so huge. 24% on this kind of sales is just amazing. But my question is, can they scale without increasing cost at the same rate that they've been. And I'm, I'm nervous about that. So let's just take a look at like, what can this company actually capture as far as market share? In the US pet market sales are about 100 
billion dollars. And look at the growth of this from 2011 to 2020. It's insane. It's growing so much every year. And I think they have a large opportunity to capture a decent percentage of this. Now, I also found that on this site, statistics.com, I believe, the company, uh, the pet food store, uh, the pet food sales alone are $93.9 billion. The question I have is, can this com company even capture 20% of this market over the next 10 years? What I don't know is how much of this is e-commerce versus in-store. Are in-store sales still trumping e-commerce sales? I really don't think physical pet stores are going away anytime soon. I'd have to imagine physical stores are going to capture more than 50% of this for as long as I can see out into the future. Now, I could be totally wrong, but I know every time I go into a pet store, it's packed. People love shopping for their pets, with their pets. For things that you just want shipped on a set cadence like food, Chewy probably will win that over time. And that's where their, their key differentiator is. But when it comes to toys, leashes, collars, I feel physical stores still have the edge. I think it would be foolish for me to ever predict that Chewy would do more than 30 billion in sales a year, even 10 years from now. Again, I'd love for them to prove me wrong, and I probably will be wrong. But think about Target, Walmart, and all these other big brands. They're not going anywhere when it comes to the food market for pets and the pet supply market as a whole. Now, the stock on the day I took it, you know, it was about $83 with a market cap of $34.74 billion. You know, it will definitely have changed by the time you see this. So let's be honest here. This stock is pricey, in my opinion. A company that basically is break-even on the balance sheet is going to have to grow a ton to continue competing in a very competitive market. It's going to have to offer shares to the market to raise money. Unless I'm missing something, which is absolutely possible few questions that I really don't have an answer to, but I've thought about. What percent of pet market can Chewy absolutely obtain? I don't think they'll ever even get to 20%. And you think about it, brands like Petco, PetSmart, Walmart, Target, Amazon are always going to have a decent share of the market. Realistically, 5%, maybe 10%. Now, the next question is when are they going to be profitable? I'm guessing 2024, but honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if it was 2025 or 2026. Now, I could be wrong, and there's something in the works, and they end up turning a corner or break even in 2023, but I actually would not be surprised if this company is not profitable in the year 2025. So you can probably tell I'm not buying this stock right now. It's too expensive, too little upside, and too much risk. I, that doesn't mean the company won't 2x, 3x, 5x in the next 3-5 years. It also doesn't mean the company won't half its share price in the next 3 years. But the company's valuation is rich. Its balance sheet and company culture are ultimately what scared me away. If this company had a billion of cash on top of its liabilities, I'd be so much more excited about it. Now, on a positive note, there is a huge total addressable market potential for Chewy, and I personally use it for my cat food and dog food. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't see this company offer shares to the market within the next six months to a year. In fact, if the company does and the share price were to drop a bunch and they loaded their balance sheet with cash, I'd actually start looking at the company a bit harder. Now, with that said, that's my analysis. What are you all doing? Buying, holding, selling? Am I wrong in my analysis? And if so, why? Thanks again for hanging out to the end. And until next time, invest safely.